the integral of five to the cotangent x times cosecant squared x dx is equal to, well, let's try to do this very quickly first. This is essentially just five to the u du, right? Because the derivative of cotangent x is minus cosecant squared x dx. So all that's missing is the minus sign. And then this is just minus five to the cotangent x over ln five plus c, right? Let's backtrack a little bit and fill in some of the details there. If we let u equal the cotangent of x, then du is negative cosecant squared x dx. So what's missing here is the minus sign that needs to be part of the du, right? So we'll put in the minus sign and then we'll undo that by putting a minus sign outside of the integral symbol, okay? So now let's do the substitution. In place of cotangent x, I put u, and in place of negative cosecant squared x dx, I put du. And now this is a standard integral. Five to the u becomes five to the u over the ln of five. Don't forget to put the minus sign in. That's just sitting there, and we have to add our arbitrary constant. And then finally, we replace u by cotangent x as we had gotten before. Find the area of the region bounded by the lines x equals 1, x equals 4, and y equals 0, and the curve y equals e to the 3x. All right, let's look at a picture of this. So here we have x equals 1 and x equals 4. Those are the two vertical lines. And y equals 0 is just the x-axis. And here's the curve y equals e to the 3x. Now, if you're sketching this, um, you don't have to be too accurate about what this is. The only important thing is that this is always above the x-axis, right? Because e to something is always positive. In particular, between 1 and 4, it's definitely positive. So that means that the interpretation of this area as an integral is just the, the most straightforward thing possible. We're just going to compute the integral from 1 to 4, e to the 3x dx. Okay. This integral has a small substitution, right? u equals 3x, then du is 3dx. So we are missing a 3 when we integrate, so we should undo that with a 1 third. Uh, maybe this one's uh, easy enough that you could do in your head. We just need 1 third e to the 3x from 1 to 4. I didn't change the limits because I didn't formally do the substitution. I just did it in my head, essentially right? I, I know that u is 3x and du is 3dx, so I needed the one-third, but I left it as e to the 3x, so I used the original limits. Um, so now I'm just going to plug in the 4 and plug in the 1. 3 times 4 is 12. 3 times 1 is 3. And we can factor out one-third from each of these as well as e cubed from each of these. And we're left with one-third e cubed times e to the ninth minus 1. If the integral from 2 to 5, f of 3x plus k dx is equal to b, where k and b are real numbers, then in terms of b, the integral from 6 plus k to 15 plus k, f of x dx is equal to what? Well, we're going to do a formal substitution here. We'll let u equal 3x plus k. Then du is equal to 3dx. Okay. So we have b, I'm just writing this backwards, b is equal to this integral, 2 to 5 f of 3x plus k dx, right? Now notice that we need a 3 here with the dx in order to replace it with du. So we put in the 3, and I'll pull out a third in front to undo the 3. So we're going to replace 3x plus k by u and 3dx by du, All right? But we also have to change the limits. When x is 2, u is 3 times 2, which is 6 plus k. And when x is 5, u is 15 plus k. Okay, so we have the integral from 6 plus k to 15 plus k f of x dx. That's what we're trying to find. I'm just going to change the x's to u's. Now, that's perfectly okay because x here is just a dummy variable, meaning the answer doesn't actually have an x in it. It's just a variable used in the process of integrating. We can name it whatever we want. I just chose to name it u so that it matches up with the u here. And we could see bringing the one-third to the other side of the equation by multiplying by 3, that that's equal to 3b.
Let f be a function that is continuous for all real numbers. The table below gives values of f for selected points in the closed interval 1, 11. Use a left Riemann sum with subintervals indicated by the data in the table to approximate the integral from 1 to 11 f of x dx. Show the work that leads to your answer. Okay, so we want to approximate the integral from 1 to 11 f of x dx. All right, so this is pretty straightforward. We're doing a left Riemann sum. So each of these intervals, we have the interval 1, 5, 5, 6, 6, 8, and 8, 11. For each one, we're going to choose the left endpoint and then look at the value of the function there. So for the first subinterval from 1 to 5, we choose the left endpoint. F of 1 is 3. So I put 3 times the length of the interval. 5 minus 1 is 4. For the next interval, we take F of 5, which is 5 times the length, which is 6 minus 5, or 1. For the next subinterval, f of 6 is 1, and the length is 8 minus 6, which is 2. And for the last one, f of 8 is negative 3, and the length of the subinterval is 11 minus 8, which is 3. Okay, so that comes out to 10, right? So that's 12 plus 5 plus 2 minus 9, which is 10, and that's the answer. Now, it's probably worth looking at a picture of what happened here to help us understand what we just did. Well, what we did is we drew one, two, three, four rectangles, one for each subinterval. So for the subinterval from one to five, we drew the rectangle whose length here goes from one to five, right? And the height is given by the left endpoint, so it's f of one, which is three. So we go up to the point one, comma three. For the second rectangle, the length goes from 5 to 6, and the height goes up to 5. It's at the point 5, 5. For the next one, we go between 6 and 8, and the height is 1. And for the last one, we go between 8 and 11, and the height is negative 3, so we go down 3. So all we did here, these products are equal to the areas of these various rectangles. And if you want to see sort of everything written out in detail in terms of the formula we did, f of 1 times 5 minus 1, or over here, f of 1 times 5 minus 1, plus f of 5, which is 5, times 6 minus 5, or here, f of 5 times 6 minus 5, and you could do that for each of the four rectangles to get the left Riemann sum. Let h and k be twice differentiable functions such that h of 1 is equal to negative 4, h of 8 is 6, k of negative 3 is equal to 1, and k of 2 is equal to 8. Let f be the function given by f of x equals h of k of x. So f is the composition of the two functions, h and k. Suppose that h prime of 1 is equal to k prime of 2, and h prime of 8 is equal to k prime of negative 3. Explain why there must be a value d with d between negative 3 and 2, such that f double prime of d is equal to 0. All right. Well. We're given that h and k are both twice differentiable. That means that f is twice differentiable, right? Because f is the composition of h and k, and the composition of differentiable functions is differentiable. It also means that f prime is differentiable. That's the same thing as saying f is twice differentiable. It means you can take the derivative, and then you can take the derivative again, okay? And that also implies that f prime is continuous. So in particular, f prime is continuous on the closed interval negative 3, 2, and differentiable on the open interval negative 3, 2. So we can invoke the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem guarantees that there is a value d with d between negative 3 and 2, such that f double prime of d is equal to f prime of 2 minus f prime of negative 3 over 2 minus negative 3. Notice that I applied the mean value theorem to the derivative of f, right? Because the derivative of f is continuous where we need it and differentiable where we need it. So we can apply the mean value theorem to it to get information about the second derivative related to the first derivative. Okay. Now, f prime of x is, by the chain rule, h prime of k of x times the derivative of the inside, which is k prime of x. Okay. So f prime of negative 3 is h prime of k of negative 3 times k prime of negative 3. Now, k of negative 3 is equal to 1. So we can replace k of negative 3 here by 1, right? 
And now f prime of two is equal to h prime of k of two times k prime of two. And k of two is given to be eight, so we can replace k of two here by eight. Okay, so now substituting, f prime of two is h prime of eight times k prime of two, and f prime of negative three is h prime of one times k prime of negative three, and that's over two minus negative three, which is two plus three, or five. Now, we're gonna use the fact that h prime of one is equal to k prime of two, to replace h prime of one by k prime of two here. And h prime of eight is k prime of negative three, so we can replace h prime of eight with k prime of negative three. And look what happened. Both of these things, both of these terms here, are equal to each other, right? So we actually get zero. Let h and k be twice differentiable functions, such that h of one is equal to negative four, h of eight is six, k of negative three is one, and k of two is eight. Let f be the function given by f of x equals h of k of x, just like the last problem. Suppose that h double prime of x equals k double prime of x equals zero for all x. Find all points of inflection on the graph of f. All right, so I'm gonna do this two different ways. First way, since h double prime of x and k double prime of x are both zero for all x, it follows that h and k have to be linear functions, okay? If you're not clear on that, I'll, I'll go over that a little bit after we finish the solution. Now, the composition of two linear functions is also linear. Again, if, if that's not clear to you, I'll show you the details in a moment. But it follows that uh, f is a linear function, so, right, because f is the composition of these two linear functions, so f is linear, and so the graph of f has no points of inflection. Lines don't have points of inflection, right? So just to fill in some of the details here, if h double prime of x is zero, then anti-differentiating gives us that h prime of x is just a constant, right? Because the derivative of a constant is zero, so the antiderivative of zero is an arbitrary constant. Anti-differentiating again, the antiderivative of c is cx, and we always get an, another arbitrary constant. So let's call that d. And that shows that h is a linear function, right? It has the form constant x plus another constant. Similarly, k of x is equal to some constant times x plus b. The same computation shows this. So I just called it ax plus b this time. And finally, let's show that the composition of h and k, which is f, right? f, is, f of x is h of k of x is also linear. Well, k of x is ax plus b, so substituting that in, we get h of ax plus b, and h of ax plus b, we plug ax plus b in for x into the function h, and we get c times ax plus b plus d, and just regrouping, we get cax plus cb plus d. We see that this is also linear. It's a constant times x plus some other constant. The constants look a little messier this time, but they're just constants all the same. A second solution. Taking the derivative of f using the chain rule, we get f prime of x is h prime of k of x, the outer part, times k prime of x, the inner part. So f double prime of x is, well, that's a product rule. So it's the first, h prime of k of x times the derivative of the second, which is k double prime of x, plus the second, which is k prime of x times the derivative of the first, which is a chain rule. It's h double prime of k of x times k prime of x. Okay, so, well, since we're given that h double prime and k double prime are always zero, in place of uh, k double prime here, we could put zero. And in place of h double prime of whatever here, we could put zero. And we see that that whole thing just gives us zero. So the graph of f has no points of inflection. Let f be the continuous function defined on the closed interval negative five eight, whose graph consisting of three line segments and a semicircle centered at four zero is shown below. Let capital F be the function that is defined by capital F of X is equal to the integral from two to X little f of T dt. Find the values of capital F of eight and capital F of negative one. All right, so capital F of eight 
just substituting, right? We're plugging in an eight for X. So we get the integral from two to eight F of T DT. So I'm gonna split that up. Why? Because we're going, so the integral from two to eight F of T DT using the graph is taking the area under the semicircle, that's from two to six, and then the area under this triangle that goes from six to eight. Okay, so I split it up into those two pieces so that I could use the geometry to get the answer. Well, this is just a semicircle of radius two. So it's pi times two squared, but it's only a semicircle. So that's why we divide by two here. And this is a triangle with base two height two. So it's one half two times two, right? So that simplifies to, well, four over two is two, two pi plus these cancel and you just left with two. So you get two pi plus two for F of eight. And now, Let's do f of negative one. Okay, so that's the integral from two to negative one f of t dt. Now, since two is less than that, uh, two is bigger than negative one, I should say. Since two is bigger than negative one, I'm going to flip the integral so that the numbers are going in order, right? We like to go from the left to the right so that the geometric interpretation matches up more nicely. Um, so in order to flip the limits of the integral, we have to negate the integral, right? So it's the negative of the integral from negative one to two, from negative one to two, like that. Okay, so that's the negative of the integral from negative one to zero. So I'm gonna go from here to here to get this little trapezoid, plus the integral from zero to two to get this little triangle, right? Okay, so the area of the trapezoid, this is a trapezoid with two bases, base one over here has length one, and the second base here has length two, right? So one plus two, and we average the two bases. So it's one plus two over two, and we multiply by the height, which is one, right? And it's negative. We put a minus sign in front of it because it's below the x-axis. And then the same thing for the triangle here. It's below the x-axis, so we put a minus sign, and then it's one half two times two. Okay. Remember, this other minus sign came from changing the order of the integration here, right? which limit came first. And these other two minus signs came from the fact that where the area is below the x-axis instead of above. Okay, So just simplifying that, we have the negative of negative 3 halves minus 2, which is positive 7 halves.